Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis Charity I said in an earlier chapter that there were four cardinal virtues and three theological virtues. The three theological ones are faith, hope and charity. Faith is going to be dealt with in the last two chapters. Charity was partly dealt with in chapter 7, but there I concentrated on that part of charity which is called forgiveness. I now want to add a little more. First, as to the meaning of the word. Charity now means simply what used to be called alms, that is, giving to the poor. Originally, it had a much wider meaning. You can see how it got the modern sense. If a man has charity, giving to the poor is one of the most obvious things he does, and so people came to talk as if that were the whole of charity. In the same way, rhyme is the most obvious thing about poetry, and so people come to mean by poetry simply rhyme and nothing more. Charity means love in the Christian sense. But love, in the Christian sense, does not mean an emotion. It is a state not of the feelings, but of the will. That state of the will which we have naturally about ourselves and must learn to have about other people. I pointed out in the chapter on forgiveness that our love for ourselves does not mean that we like ourselves. It means that we wish our own good. In the same way, Christian love, or charity for our neighbours, is quite a different thing from liking or affection. We like or are fond of some people and not of others. It is important to understand that this natural liking is neither a sin nor a virtue, any more than your likes and dislikes in food are a sin or a virtue. It is just a fact. But of course, what we do about it is either sinful or or virtuous. Natural liking or affection for people makes it easier to be charitable towards them. It is therefore normally a duty to encourage our affections, to like people as much as we can, just as it is often our duty to encourage our liking for exercise or wholesome food, not because this liking is itself the virtue of charity, but because it is a help to it. On the other hand, it is also necessary to keep a very sharp lookout for fear our liking for some one person makes us uncharitable or even unfair to someone else. There are even cases where our liking conflicts with our charity towards the person we like. For example, a doting mother may be tempted by natural affection to spoil her child, that is, to gratify her own affectionate impulses at the expense of the child's real happiness later on. But though natural likings should normally be encouraged, it would be quite wrong to think that the way to become charitable is to sit trying to manufacture affectionate feelings. Some people are cold by temperament. That may be a misfortune for them, but it is no more a sin than having a bad digestion is a sin. And it does not cut them out from the chance, or excuse them from the duty, of learning charity. The rule for all of us is perfectly simple. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbour. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. There is, indeed, one exception. If you do him a good turn not to please God and obey the law of charity, but to show him what a fine, forgiving chap you are, and to put him in your debt, and then sit down to wait for his gratitude, you will probably be disappointed. People are not fools. They have a very quick eye for anything like showing off or patronage. But whenever we do good to another self just because it is a self, made like us by God, and desiring its own happiness as we desire ours, 
we shall have learned to love it a little more, or at least to dislike it less. Consequently, though Christian charity sounds a very cold thing to people whose heads are full of sentimentality, and though it is quite distinct from affection, yet it leads to affection. The difference between a Christian and a worldly man is not that the worldly man has only affections or likings and the Christian has only charity. The worldly man treats certain people kindly because he likes them. The Christian, trying to treat everyone kindly, finds himself liking more and more people as he goes on, including people he could not even have imagined himself liking at the beginning. This same spiritual law works terribly in the opposite direction. The Germans, perhaps, at first ill-treated the Jews because they hated them. Afterwards, they hated them much more because they had ill-treated them. The more cruel you are, the more you will hate, and the more you hate, the more cruel you will become, and so on in a vicious circle forever. Good and evil both increase at compound interest. That is why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which, a few months later, you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. An apparently trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or railway line or bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack otherwise impossible. Some writers use the word charity to describe not only Christian love between human beings, but also God's love for man and man's love for God. About the second of these two, people are often worried. They are told they ought to love God. They cannot find any such feeling in themselves. What are they to do? The answer is the same as before. Act as if you did. Do not sit trying to manufacture feelings. Ask yourself, if I were sure that I loved God, what would I do? When you have found the answer, go and do it. On the whole, God's love for us is a much safer subject to think about than our love for Him. Nobody can always have devout feelings, and even if we could, feelings are not what God principally cares about. Christian love, either towards God or towards man, is an affair of the will. If we are trying to do His will, we are obeying the commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. He will give us feelings of love if He pleases. We cannot create them for ourselves, and we must not demand them as a right. But the great thing to remember is that, though our feelings come and go, His love for us does not. It is not wearied by our sins or our indifference, and therefore it is quite relentless in its determination that we shall be cured of those sins. At whatever cost to us, at whatever cost to Him. Thank you.